Greetings. Happy Thursday. Welcome to the Steve Day Show here live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio and podcast. I am Steve Dace alongside Todd Erzin. Aaron McIntyre is still on paternity leave. Uh, we do get uh, one of our teammates back, though. Uh, my daughter, Anastasia, returning to the show for three non-political questions later in the program for the first time since uh, giving birth to our first granddaughter, Autumn. So we do have her returning, but we've got another week plus until Aaron is back. But we are in the very capable hands of our well-trained and well-prepared uh, intern who is, as Todd, you like to say, there she is, Victoria. She is as uh, cool as a cucumber over there. Yeah. Just manning the ship, just crushing it. She's doing well. I know. I mean, somebody raised her right. They should get some credit for Aaron that. Aaron McIntyre, who? Well, Just, I wasn't going to say it. As if, you know, and you can kind of tell maybe he's feeling the pressure a little bit. You know, when he said that he was going to go ahead and send in his notes for Theology yeah. Thursday, and you and I looked at each other like, sure, you are a kid. Yeah. Right? Duty did. Yeah. And they're like extremely well detailed. <laughs> right? I'm still here. My name's Aaron, not Victoria. FYI. All right. So maybe it's not so hard to get a perfect worldview score after all, you know? Yeah, maybe it's not. Uh, But uh, we will get to continue our uh, study uh, verse by verse of the book of Romans coming up on Theology Thursday next hour. And yes, Aaron did submit his thoughts. So we will include those in the conversation as well. Don't forget, of course, we're brought to you by our friends over at First Cup Coffee Company. They have a flavor for every freedom loving American with the roast date right there on every bag. So you'll see that it's shipped to you within days of being roasted. Uh, And if you want to try it today, it's not just because it has the same, the company has the same value system that you do. It's because they make great coffee and They have the same value system that that you do. So if you want to try it today, 10% off at firstcup.com if you use the promo code DACE. That's 10% off if you use the promo code DACE, and uh, you'll get an additional 10% off and uh, for the life of the subscription if you subscribe every single month. You can't beat it. Firstcup.com. Use the code DACE. Good friend of mine uh, from uh, the great state of Michigan. Well, the formerly great state of Michigan, anyway. Uh, he, He texted me yesterday, and he's like, okay. I... I've been listening to the show and no offense, nothing you do has whetted my appetite to get me to subscribe to the blaze. Cause I can just hear it from you anytime I want. <laughs> right? So he's like, um, but this bought and paid for special that you guys are talking about, man, this I'm interested in. Okay. This I'm interested in. And, uh, he's a, he's a very successful attorney in Michigan. So he, he sees the, 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 the underbelly of society on a regular basis, right? So he goes, uh, is it really straight up? Are you taking one for the team here? Or is it really this impactful? And I said, straight up, I'm underselling it, if anything. Straight up. So he went and subscribed to, to The Blaze just to watch this yesterday. And he's like, holy cow. Oh my. That was both incredible and infuriating. I, I'm not even. I, I don't even know how to calm down after watching this. And it's all it, the economy of it. I mean, a lot of times. Yeah, this is only like 45 minutes, guys. That's it. Yeah. A lot of times to get a deep enough dive to get through all the chaos. You know, it it takes two hours sometimes, legitimately. Right. And that's hard these days. And plus, people have just been like, I can only read 140 characters at a time, and. I, this 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 seems they understand that at the blaze they're like we, we are going to give it to you shot no chaser this this thing punches and, you in the yes. mouth and it doesn't remove the fist until the credits I know, roll i know okay i mean you can't go anywhere i mean that that's how incredible this is if you want to see this all right it is still available at blaze tv uh it's called bought and paid for how politicians get filthy rich get 30 dollars off uh, with the code dace originals to see it as a blaze tv subscriber at daceoriginals.com that's daceoriginals.com you'll get 30 dollars off with the code daceoriginals.com at daceoriginals is the code you don't want to miss this and you know todd you and i you and i were talking about after we saw this that um, this kind of, we thought, set a new bar of expectation, just, I think, frankly, for our entire movement and industry, yeah. let alone on a specific level, us as a company. Yeah. Like, if you're going to go here now, yeah, you know, there's a, there's a whole lot of talk today that all we need to do is expose. But if, but if, if we're just exposing to the point of, of not 
necessitating an action, provoking a call to action, then what is that? I mean, it, it, it's just an, it's just more mining of talking points, but, and there, and there may be more prudent and impactful talking points, but largely there will be no impact to them if it, it's not accompanied by action. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, and, and so, you know, you and I thought that this moment was a watershed moment for mm-hmm. our entire movement industry. And certainly us as a company, this is, I mean, the calling out of Tommy Tuberville, Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, their names are called out on here. Okay for uh for playing the, the for playing the racket of washington dc uh and it, nobody is safe r or d i mean this is a truly prophetic work it's get busy living or get busy dying right that's it and and because a lot of times when we say exposure i think that is kind of you know we have our code names too, like the politicians do, like the new code name for, well, then I uh, had a meeting with the FBI is code for, then they showed me the embarrassing personal information they have on me and, or they cut me a check. Right. Okay. Um, when we, a lot of times say exposure, we really don't mean it, you know, it's like I've got, like I've got, we yeah, laugh yeah I've, and... I've got this guy hounding me who's a professional sports better. He's one of these, uh, uh, oh, I just expose, just expose. So, I mean, I pointed out yesterday that. That Trump, after after used after FISA was used to almost take down his entire presidency illegally, and here's a chance to get to at least pretend to get rid of it. Trump's like, "I'll oh, just go do whatever you want," and his reply back was, "Well, thank you for uh, your contribution in trying to help uh, hurt us win the most important election ever." See, it, 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 we don't really mean expose. We really mean just just dig even deeper in making me already disdain and dislike the people I already disdain and dislike, who are probably wor- frankly worthy. Of your disdain oh, yeah. and dislike, if we're being honest, <laughs> okay? But but if if that's not the upholding of a standard, though, that's the furthering of a narrative. What this special does is uphold a standard and say, this is right, this is wrong, and we don't care what the letter after your name is, you're in the wrong if you if you defy this standard. That's what makes it a prophetic work. And, and to me, I think it raises the bar of where we need to go. So I thought today, since the whole new thing is expose. And since you and I both are saying, this puts a challenge on us as a show. Yeah. If this is where we're going as a network now, we've got to take our we got we got to pick our game up. We got to take our game to the next level, right? Happily, yeah. So, let's do some truly prophetic exposing, shall we? I can smell the sulfur. Yeah, I, right. I I think that we shall. Okay. Today is a day for for nailing some things to the door. Uh, for things being recorded. For posterity. Because what's, what's transpired over the last 24 hours it is, is, is one, is, it's one of the most prophetic things I've witnessed as a believer. And I have no problem holding, even though there's not a great market for it, I have no problem holding Donald Trump accountable when I think he does something wrong. Like I just mentioned on the FISA thing, just just telling Republicans, go ahead and vote to renew the very thing that was used to try. It's, it's essentially, hey, go ahead and renew the uh, lease on the weapon of mass destruction the swamp has. I, 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 that's inexplicable to me. I, I don't even want to try to understand it. I mean, I, I can't, like I say about save women's sports and the girls just go out there and compete against guys and, and say it. I can't fight for them harder than they want to fight for themselves. Correct. If Trump is going to not even ask the Republican Party that he controls, by the way, if he's not even going to ask them, hey, can you at least give me a show vote on the program that they use to try to, you know, uh, essentially destroy my presidency for three years, then I, I can't fight for the I can't fight the swamp for him harder than he'll fight it either. Right. You That's just can't. A very hard lesson to learn. But then there are things I think he gets blamed for that he should not get blamed for. Ultimately, yes, is a captain responsible for everything that happens on his ship? Yes. But but there are first officers in various departments on a ship too that overlook certain they, they are they are given the authority to oversee that particular sector of a ship because while a captain is responsible for everything that happens under his watch, he cannot, however, execute everything that happens under his watch on the entire ship either, though, can he? It's a very, it's a vast, pardon the pun, the ship is a vast enterprise, right? You know what I mean? It is. And this, this requires people of, of capability and integrity to, and, and, and ingenuity to run these departments on his behalf, right? Yes. And a lot of times that authority has to be delegated. And in the last few years, the American Evangelical Church has been given the opportunity to have 
two of its graduates placed in, I mean, some of the top five or ten most influential positions on the entire planet. Like, first and second in line of succession to the U.S. presidency, which is the most powerful office on the planet, level of influence. And, and, this is, and, and if there's anything that, that Trump, at least in his previous iterations, showed, it's that he's malleable. That's what kind of surprised us, that he would listen to his base. He, he, if, if we put enough pressure on him, if we asked, you know, uh, persistent enough, he'd give us the things that we wanted. That's what, we didn't anticipate that when we didn't vote for him in 2016, right? Mm-hmm. And, that, and, and that was the biggest thing is about his entire presidency that shocked us. Oh, wait, he's actually going to keep his word on some of this mm-hmm. stuff. That's what kind of threw us off. Yeah. And then the challenge was on us. Well, since we were never Trump, do we now oppose the stuff that we always said we were for because he's doing it or are we actually for the things that we said we were for and we made the decision we're for the things we, th- we said we were for no matter who's actually doing it Correct. right and so that's you know how we ended up vociferously as a, as a show voting and supporting his candidacy in 2020 all right um this was an incredible opportunity for the church and it, 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 it failed one of them miserably and it's failing the other one miserably right now R- what you're seeing right now is a continuation of what Mike Pence did with his, with his COVID commission. And yes, ultimately, Donald Trump was president, correct? Yes. But on a day-to-day basis, does that mean that Mike Pence is without any authority? On a day-to-day basis, who presided over those meetings? Him. He did. And we know this both from watching, and it was testified to by Scott Atlas. Yes. Okay. Painfully that Mike so. Pence was ultimately in charge, and then just did whatever Debbie Burks told him to do, and, and rejected everybody else, like Atlas, who tried to say otherwise. This was a moment to be Daniel to the king. This was a moment to serve the king well. I mean, you you do everything you can to serve the king well, even a pagan king, up until he asked you to violate something that God says is sacred. And that's what you see Daniel do, right? I mean, he is an excellent magistrate for the king until the king says, well, now you can only pray to me. You can't pray to Jehovah anymore. And Daniel says, that's something you know, I, you've asked me to do something I can't do. So the answer is no. I mean, I'll be excellent at everything else, but I'm not going to treat you as God, right? This was an opportunity for Mike Pence to be excellent at everything else. And he failed just like he failed. He, he gave us the, the terrible loss of religious liberty. That was one of his last acts as governor of Indiana. He said while running for president, it was okay. He was going to let parents castrate their kids because that's how I love my neighbor as I love myself. And now, in the last 24 hours, you've watched Mike Johnson as Speaker of the House. So you saw Mike Pence at a moment that we desperately needed someone with a biblical worldview. And Donald Trump put someone as close to him as he possibly could in that position to advise him with one. He made him the vice president of the United States. He gave him the power. He delegated his own authority. We talk about all the authority he delegated to Fauci, and that is true. But he also delegated authority to Mike Pence. Absolutely. And Mike Pence had more authority than Fauci and could have executed it and didn't. He executed us instead. And we damn near lost our entire way of life. We are now in the process of maybe permanently losing it. And it's, again, another so-called evangelical presiding over this. If Mike Johnson had gone to Mar-a-Lago last weekend and said, Mr. President, I don't believe you're going to win re-election if we do blank, 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 blank. If we don't secure the border or at least or at least put up a vote and make the Democrats vote it down. If we don't at least do a show vote on these things, we're going to lose. Do you not think Trump probably would have gone ahead? Okay, then, Mike, let's do it. Do you think he probably would have done it? Because I kind of think that he probably would have. I think you're probably right. Yeah. At least the odds are way higher than they would yes. have been given what we would happen the other way. Fair. Yes. But did he do that? No. No, he didn't. And so instead of sending Donald Trump Daniel, and we have two men now in position to be a Daniel, vice president and speaker of the house, in position to be a Daniel, they're Jezebel instead. Ahab, act out even worse. Be even more narcissistic. You know, in in the book of Ezekiel, God says to the prophet, he warns the watchman on the wall. He says, listen, I will punish the people for their sins. I am a just God. But I also appointed people to be watchmen on the wall to warn them of what would happen if they went down these roads. If you do not perform your duty as a watchman on the wall, I will punish you for the people's sins just as much as I will punish them because that was your goal or your duty and you did not fulfill it, right? Amen, amen, I say to you. And by the way, one of the ways that we have that we have described since the founding of our country 
public servants is as servants. Where do we get that language from? That I get power to serve others. Where's that language from? The son of man came not to be served, but to serve right yes. out of the scriptures. The idea that they are government, that if you serve in government, you're a minister on behalf of the people. Where's all this language from? The very Bible that Mike Pence and Mike Johnson claim to represent. So why did they fail us and the country and put this country on an existential cliff that through the power of a very imperfect man, Donald Trump, they could have done better and done much better and otherwise and didn't. Instead, they fed his worst instincts instead. They Jezebeled him. They failed him. Why? I'm going to explain to you why. It's a tragedy in three acts. See, yesterday you saw perhaps the greatest, see that as the worst, side-by-side -side comparison of the ecosystem of the two parties you may ever unfortunately get to see. Because if it gets any worse than this, you probably won't have a country to see it anyway. What happened yesterday is on the same day Mike Johnson violated every single morsel, every, every cell, every atom of his mandate to betray his base. He did this to betray his base. And, and he did so by continuing to do nothing to secure our border while defending Ukraine's and, every, and Israel's and everybody else's. That same day as the Speaker of the Republican House, the Majority Leader of the Democratic Senate, Charles Schumer, he did the same thing. He violated every morsel, every molecule, every atom of his mandate, but he did so to honor his base and protected the man, Mr. Mayorkas, who is one of those primarily responsible for the invasion we're currently having at the border. It doesn't get any clearer than that. The two most powerful members of Congress, one in each chamber, one with the biblical worldview, betrays his base and his mandate to betray his country. The other, a product of the spirit of the age, does all the same things, but it's to actually honor his base. And that, folks, is the most plain picture of the ecosystem of these two parties I can imagine. So that's the setup. That's the backstory. That's Act 1. Let's get to Act 2. Mike Pence and Mike Johnson have risen to power more than any other evangelicals in their generation. And they sadly but perfectly personify the nicer than God, piety over conviction. I bounce my eyes when the young lady comes in. I'm all for doing that. Read all the books. I know Fred Stoker on a first name basis. But that is not a substitute for, hey, I bounced my eyes when the young lady with the yoga pants came in. But on the other hand, I let you rape the young lady. That's not the trade, guys. That's not the trade. Okay? The young lady's asking you to bounce your eyes and then kick that dude's ass before he rapes her. Do both, man. Piety over conviction, no use to you in any kind of a fight, cowards that have infested too many of America's evangelical pulpits for much of the last generation. This is another reminder that what is in our pulpits is what will mostly come forth from our pews. So this is the battle that's gone on and on over and over again. This is act two. Let's get to the climax, shall we? And I promise you, in case you were thinking otherwise, it will not be a happy ending. This is from my scripture reading this morning. Just complete providence, this came up on my Bible and a, a, a verse scripture of reading of the day. Moreover, I'm going to read it to you. Moreover, Jehoram made high places. These are altars to the, demon, to the demon Asherah to perform sex rites as worship. That's what was going on there. That's what these high places were. Uh, he made these high places in the hill country of Judah, that's Israel, uh, and led the inhabitants of Jerusalem into whoredom and made Judah go astray. And a letter came to him from Elijah, the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, because you have not walked in the ways of Jehoph Jehoshaphat, your father, or in the ways of Asa, king of Judah, but have walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, and have enticed Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem into whoredom, as the house of Ahab led A Israel into whoredom. And also you have killed your brothers of your father's house, who were better than you. Behold, the Lord will bring a great plague on your people. Your children, your wives, and all your possessions, and you yourself will have a severe sickness with the disease of your bowels until your bowels come out because of the disease day by day he is saying your judgment will be you're going to crap yourself to death entrails and all 
And the Lord stood up against Jehoram, the anger of the Philistines and of the Arabians who are near the Ethiopians. And they came up against Judah and invaded it and carried away all the possessions they found that belonged to the king's house and also his sons and his wives, so that no son was left except Jehoaz, his youngest son. And after all this, the Lord struck him in his bowels with an incurable disease. In the course of time, at the end of two years, the Lord made him suffer like this for two years. He crapped himself out for two years. At the end of two years, his bowels came out because of the disease, and he died in great agony. His people made no fire in his honor, like the fires made of his fathers or for his fathers. He was 32 years old when he began to reign and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem and he departed with no one's regret. They buried him in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings forsaken. That's second Chronicles chapter 21, verses 11 through 20. If you're a Christian you believe the God who cursed this wicked political ruler in a very violent, painful, and graphic way for demonically influencing the people was Jesus Christ. Because to be a Christian is to believe that Jesus Christ is, the, is God, the son of the Trinity. How many Christians even knew this was in the Bible? I was talking to a sincere believer just yesterday, a real man's man as well, no shrink and violent man, loves the Lord and a man's man. And, and yet when I quoted from Nehemiah 13 to him, about beating the people and pulling the beards of those who were defiling the temple, he was stunned. He had no idea that was even in the scriptures. If you do not go to a church that you can foresee even preaching on this passage, never again go to that church. Don't be like the girls who keep competing against the guys. Stop. For that church is the very problem with the dying culture that we are living through. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, that is going to be a good many of the churches me and many evangelicals enjoy attending. In our era, see, we have created a new heresy. We have sanitized the Bible. Antibacterial wiped it for your satisfaction. We put a mask on it to make sure it wouldn't spread. Most evangelical churches aren't preaching open heresy, but they're not preaching an open Bible either. They are self-editing. They are determining, as if they were their own papacy, what scriptures you are to hear and which you are not, which you can handle and which you cannot, which will fill their seats and coffers and which will not. Spoiler alert! This passage from Second Chronicles will not inspire another hit song from Hillsong or another wave of false converts, converts from the suburbs who tithe. And though that is no excuse for any believer, for part of our individual relationship with Christ is to seek him individually through his word. You won't stand up with a church or a pastor or a priest at judgment. You'll stand naked and alone yourself. Nevertheless, this new heresy does play right into our convenience-driven culture. Just as too many parents were too busy to find out what their kids were learning at the government schools, uh, they delegated discipling their children to for decades, and then later on we are now reaping a harvest of communist degenerates and God-haters, but I repeat myself. As a result, we delegated our time in God's Word to Sunday mornings at church because we were too busy to do it ourselves. And a generation later now, we have ended up with soft-headed, sweater-vested, pleated khaki nicer-than-God beta males like Mike Pence and Mike Johnson, who think they are loving their neighbor as they love themselves by siding with the enemy against their own God and his own people. Just like many evangelical churches do this every single week, by catering every week, every year, to those who have rejected God, repackaged as seekers, and, and put a dollar sign in those S's, baby. They have put catering to seekers, false converts who tithe, over feeding, discipling those who actually love the Lord. Does mercy triumph over judgment? Yes, we just celebrated Easter as a, the greatest example of this. But note that it doesn't cancel the judgment. There are people still going to hell. There still is a hell. And one of the reasons why is this sanitized for your comfort heresy that makes them think they're saved when they're false converts. We don't take making disciples seriously, and that is the actual great commission to disciple the nations and disciple being the root word of discipline, not to convert the nations. Now, conversion is the first step to discipleship, and one cannot be discipled without conversion, but it is just the first step, nevertheless, similar to how your marriage 
may have an, may have been formally announced on the wedding day. That's the first official day you're married. And there can't be a marriage without the wedding day, right? Right. Right. But does the marriage itself end on the wedding day? No, it's just the beginning. How successful will your marriage be if it peaks on the wedding day? Answer, not very. And neither will the church, the bride, succeed her groom, Christ, by peaking at mere conversion. By their fruit, you will know them, our Lord says. Pence and Johnson may be the most high-profile evangelicals of their generation, certainly the most powerful ranking, high in the line of succession to the most powerful office on this planet. What does the fruit of their public service reveal? Cowardice, treachery, compromise. Seeds planted by the likes of the most popular evangelical preachers of the era, the Rick Warrens, the Joel Osteens. A bad tree produces bad fruit. What comes from the pulpit is often what will come forth from the pews. The evangelical church has failed this country. It failed the president that, was, that gave them perhaps the greatest amount of power and access they could ever ask for. And it did these things because it failed to believe and rely on the word of God. Anything we do that fails to believe and rely on the word of God will also fail. As everything before us that tried to do these things also has. Todd, your thoughts. How'd we do trying to raise the bar in exposing things? Nailed it. Uh, you had an interesting back and forth, uh, which I've already told you about, uh, just yesterday, I think, with a journalist, I think generally a man of the left, uh, but during COVID was very, very skeptical, and he was trying to analyze Republicans vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Trump and how the base is just being deceived by what's going on, and you stepped in and basically did, oh, it's worse than that. The it's, base wants to be deceived. Yes, and rewards deception. This is and this is what you The grifters are in the base. Yes. They're not the they're not the people delivering the content, they're the people rewarding it. Yes. The grifters are not the grifters are not the men who fail in men's sports and then go play the women, but the women who compete with them and legitimize it. The grifters are not the churches who have who've done this sanitized heresy, but those of us who continue to populate these churches and tie to them to reward them for doing so. We're the grifters. Yes, we are the walking dead. See, the church is full of ciphers from the Matrix. You like the Matrix. Ignorance is bliss, you say. You're happy with the lie. You covet the lie. You shine and polish the lie. The lie is your idol. This is the first time I can remember, I, I know of. Maybe it's happened before. But this is the first time I can remember that the church in a culture, just quit. Just quit. Not was driven out by Islam, plague. Just quit. When it didn't even have to. There was nothing compelling it to. There was no pressure upon it. it just decided, you know what? Esau had it right the first time. Peace out. Just did it on its own. I don't recall that ever happening in church history, but it happened here. And it's why this country is in the position that it's in. And if that qualifies as blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, we're in big trouble because that's the unforgivable sin. We are in very big trouble. You guys want more things exposed? Full frontal. Careful what you wish for. So the uh, the woke mind virus is spreading. The American Medical Association is now declaring that uh, medicine 
is imbued with white supremacy. And so that's why we need uh, ESG, DEI, the lowering of standards. I am sure, I am sure the higher ups at the American Medical Association will line up to be the first to be operated on by someone who got into a medical school with lower standards. I'm sure of this. People of endless integrity, yes. Yeah, to set the example for the rest, I am sure. Anyway, this is just uh, one of the reasons to learn about stuff like this and what to do about it, why you want to get in Primus from our friends at Hillsdale College. It's the free digest of liberty. It goes out to more than six and a half million homes and businesses every single week. And a subscription is free to hear from Victor Davis Hanson, Victor, or, or Chris Rufo, Heather McDonald, Larry Arn, and so much more. Uh, there's no cost or obligation if you want to subscribe. Uh, just go to daceforhillsdale.com. That's daceforhillsdale.com right Right now, that's Dace for Hillsdale, F-O-R, Dace for Hillsdale.com. Well, a lot of people are wondering what is happening economically. I am concerned that next year we might be looking at at least a, a 2008 level downturn, regardless of what the outcome of this election is with some of the markers that we are seeing at the surface level. But what's happening below the surface? What can be done about it? Uh, Richard Werner is considered the father of quantitative easing. He's one of the most decorated economists on, literally on planet Earth. We are pleased to have him with us here today on The Blaze. Mr. Werner, my name is Steve Dace, brother. It is an honor. Thank you very much for joining us. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Let's go back to the, the quantitative easing. Explain it for dummies like me who went to government school, Richard. What is it and, and why did you recommend it? Um, I developed it when I was predicting that uh, there was going to be a significant economic downturn in Japan um, that was going to be driven by a massive banking crisis. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, when you say that now, with all the hindsight that we've had since, uh, it seems like an obvious thing. But when in 1991, I analyzed the situation, um, you see, in 91, the Bank of Japan and the central bank was for the first time lowering rates to stimulate the economy. And the stock market had already started to fall, um, you know, down by, you know, quite a bit, 35, 40%, 45%. Uh, but so a lot of people are saying, well, that's super cheap because they were still in the mode of the 1980s. You know, the Japanese economy performing extremely well, a stock market, of course, rising and rising, uh, Japanese money flooding the world, buying up assets, um, setting up factories, you know, property in, in Hawaii, uh, Pebbles Beach Golf Course, Columbia Pictures, uh, you know, Rockefeller Center. They seem to be buying everything. And it was going to be the, the next century. It was going to be the Japanese century. So then there was this a bit of a hiccup and the central bank had raised rates and the stock market had reacted and was going down but that was over they just lowered rates for the first time and the logic in the markets still is nowadays as well you see lower rates oh that's good that's a stimulus so the world's um, you know, strategists, equity uh, strategists and forecasters were all saying buy Japanese stocks. The economy was still growing at 7%. And of course, the top 20 banks in the world were Japanese. Um, and here I was warning people that um, uh, actually the Japanese banks were likely to go bankrupt and Japan was likely to move into the biggest recession since the Great Depression. And that was based on my analysis of what happened in the 80s, what was really the fundamental driving factor, namely excessive bank credit. And if you look at the allocation, uh, mainly for asset purchases, property purchases. In other words, it was a house of cards, a property bubble, credit driven. Um, and they're always unsustainable and they, when they're large enough, and this one was the largest on record, uh, will bring down the banking system and the economy with it. Now, I realized also together in parallel with my forecast, which was dire, <laughs> that um, you can actually avoid this and you can actually get out of this almost as soon as you fall into this uh, problem because you see the cause is the banking system and 
banking is essentially applied accounting. It's the banks using their balance sheet as their business model because their balance sheet is used as the money in the economy. And so, you know, why should you have a recession with record unemployment, uh, perhaps even deflation, as it then also turned out, if you can just solve the problem because it's a numerical accounting problem by adjusting the accounts. And there was a perfectly legal way to do that, and that was my QE, uh, which had two components. Number one, when these non-performing loans started to set in, I mean, to me it was clear they're going to be huge, um, up to 80% falls in asset prices, which is what happened. And that, that means um, the banking system was going to be bust, because if you have more than 20% um, of drops in asset prices from the peak, and the peak was created by this bank lending, um, and because the assets are the collateral, just with this 20% drop from the peak, you already bring down the banking system normally, and here it's going to be bigger. So, um, QE1, my, the first part of my proposal was for the central bank to step in and purchase preemptively all the non-performing loans and those that I performing essentially all real estate lending since 1985 you know for five six years in the second half of the 80s that was going to turn bad so shifted from the bank's balance sheets to the central bank balance sheet um, the central bank would buy those assets at face value and actually with that one stroke you would have solved the core of the problem hmm. because of course you know if you don't do it what then happens is uh, they do turn into non-performing loans um, that means you've got a hole on the asset side of your balance sheet and in banking that means those uh, those holes have to be uh, filled with equity but equity in banking you know, it was 10%, and in those days was actually less, um, and therefore the banks will be bust. And when the banks are bust, or, you know, they're also extremely risk averse, they won't lend, then credit creation stops, uh, shrinks, even the economy shrinks, everything contracts, you get into this, this downward spiral, uh, which then can last for, for a long time, for decades, but it's unnecessary. So QE1, the central bank purchases non, those non-performing assets at face value, you shift them from the bank balance sheets to the uh, central bank balance sheet. And now you could say, hang on, doesn't that mean you're just moving the problem from the banks to the central bank and you still have the same problem? No. This is a solution because um, the central bank, number one, doesn't have to mark the market. Um, and so you never have to realize any losses. But also, you know, even if you did, it doesn't matter. It's a central bank. Um, it, it doesn't, it's a technicality. If a central bank has a loss, so what? You know, it can just be, um, you know, um, kept on the books forever if you wanted to it wouldn't change anything now uh, and of course often in these cases um, you know you can even make a profit but that's only the first step um, the second part of QE was because I realized even if you do that um, the uh, the central uh, you know the the banks uh, will be quite shell-shocked you know by this dramatic uh, results that all their lending basically turned sour. The central banks help them, but they will still be very cautious. And so lending won't pick up. And therefore, I needed a second measure to kickstart bank credit, or you could say for central bank money to be pumped into the economy. And that's QE2, the second type. Mm -hmm. So the first type is the central bank buys non-performing assets from banks. The second QE is the central bank buys performing assets from non-banks. Because when you do that, normally the non-banks don't deal with the central bank. So when the central bank goes out, and I suggested in the 90s, you know, they should buy even property, real estate in Tokyo, turn it into parks, there weren't enough green areas. You know, but if, if just a property owner sells to the central bank, they don't have an account with the central bank, that's unusual, then how is the money paid? Well, they will give their bank account number. The central bank makes a transfer of bank reserves to the bank, and the bank then creates the money as new deposit in the seller's account, and it's pushed in, into the economy. And then you get a massive increase in purchasing power transactions, and the economy reflates. Now, the QE1 can't inflation. Um, 
defended All right, let's, Huey Wong pardon me, let, in let's, 2008. Let, let's pause there for just a second, yes. Richard, if you don't mind, because you you have mentioned about 15 things that I am seeing parallels to, just as a total <laughs> layman, in what is happening in our economy right now, and I want to make sure we have time to ref, we have time to address them before I run out here in this segment. So, I mean, am I wrong that you are, that many of the things you addressed were happening in the Japanese economy at the time are exactly what is happening in ours right now? And then if so... Is this a is this is a massive downturn avoidable as, as you thought it was at the time for the Japanese? Um, the, we can learn um, almost everything from the Japanese experience. Um, of course, our current situation is a little bit different because, for example, the inflation uh, that we've experienced peaking in uh, you know twenty two late uh, two thousand twenty two. Uh, inflation rates coming down is still there, but it's you know getting smaller. That inflation was created when the Fed and other central banks in March 2020 mm-hmm. implemented my QE2, the second type, which are designed for contracting deflationary economy, bank credit credit contracting. That wasn't the situation in March 2020 at all. In fact, the supply in the economy was being restricted, firms were being shut. Uh, and then they increased um, purging power and demand. There's the stimulus checks, and the central bank pumped money to the economy through this type of QE, purchasing assets on a large scale from non banks. That had to lead to inflation. And we're still suffering from that. So the amount of money creation pumped in quite unnecessarily, and in my view, you know, it was clearly irresponsible to do that, uh, is so enormous, it's without. Precedent. Mm. That's what happened in 2020. Mm-hmm. We're still suffering from that, but the mechanics essentially are the same. And, um, and and we should keep in mind, one can also get out of the next one if the policymakers are taking the right policies. But that's where we have the problem. What is their real goal? Um, as I've criticised before, it seems that these central planners aim at creating massive cycles, boom bust mm. cycles, asset inflation, then collapses. Now consumer price inflation. And and then, you know, downturn. So that is the problem. We can't rely on them taking the right policy measures. And that's why as investors, and you know, we have to take care of our money. We have to assume that they're not actually aiming at stability, as they always claim. They always talk about stability, but they've never delivered that. That's for sure. Right. Yeah, what's the point of a managed economy if they can't keep it stable? Then you're the, then it's the worst of both worlds. You're getting people with their thumb on the scale and instability at the same time. So, if if let's we've got about three minutes. If if I could assemble like a consortium of governors to sit down with you who have demonstrated that on other policy levels they are willing to resist the central planners in Washington D.C. Is the, is what what could they do on a state level economically to avoid what you just described? And that is actually a perfect uh, question. That is really what we should be asking, and we should demand the right policies in those terms. Well, uh, in fact, there is a lot that can be done on the state level. A key insight I had uh, from my, you know, 30 plus years of research and engaging with the policymakers is we need to push hard uh, to decentralize the banking system further. The old system we had wasn't bad in terms of having many, many banks. It's the central planners that always say, oh, we're overbanked, there's too many banks, because they want to concentrate things and mm-hmm. concentrate decision makings. But, but that will further um, you know, advance these boom bust cycles and cause instability. Stability will come when we have many more small banks, local banks, um, and the money creation decision is actually made by the banks on the ground, you see, not by the central bankers. And that's much better because you've got hundreds and thousands of decision makers lending to small firms and they need loans from from small banks because big banks, you know, once they've merged and become bigger, they don't lend to small firms. Now, what I've also found in my research is that when the even the small banks get bigger through mergers over time, they will also start to lend to bigger firms. So that's alone a reason why we should always create new local banks, community banks um, in the states and, you know, decentralized in the regions. And that's very important uh, for the U.S., where the number of banks has dropped sharply. The regulators constantly closing banks, even healthy banks. Uh, and the same in Europe, where the ECB has been fighting a war to kill banks. 6,000 banks have disappeared under the, um, under the watch of the ECB and its, its, its anti-bank policies. 
where can people go if uh, they want to get more information on this, Richard? And we, we would love to have you back when we've got more time to discuss this more in depth. But in the meantime, where can people go to get more information on what you're talking about? Well, follow me on Werner Economics. Uh, look me up on professorwerner.org. I've just started a substack, rwerner. Dot, so my initial R and then Werner dot, uh, substack dot com. Um, I'll be uh, putting out regular reports there. Um, and um, yeah, follow me on Twitter, um, Dr. Richard Werner. Um, and there's other sites, uh, richardwerner.org coming up um, soon. Great stuff. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. We'll definitely have you back. All right. Take care. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. You bet. You know, this idea, which you heard from him, if you followed this interview, the first part was very technical about the technocratic aspects of economic policy, the nuts and bolts of it. You know, specifically why quantitative easing was he, he proposed it, why he thought it was needed in Japan with the technocratic metrics on the ground happening there in their macro economy were that he thought that this would be a solution. Right. But 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 by the end of the interview, did you see what happened? We can't escape worldview on any of these fronts. It just cannot be escaped on any of these fronts. Every technocratic process, or as we would call it today, an algorithm is all based on someone's assumptions. These, these, do, these are not things that happen in, in a vacuum. These things, are, these things occur based on the decisions made off of the assumptions by human beings. And the assumption of our own economy, he used the term of what that assumption is. Did you hear what he said? He said it several times. Central planners. What do we always say the spirit of the age is after? The two things the spirit of the age is after in every decision it makes. What is it? Or what are they? Power and control. Todd, what would a central planner have? That. Yes. Power and control. When he's talking about shutting down healthy banks, it sounds exactly like the transgender debate. Yes. Chopping off healthy body parts. I mean... Get past all the technological jargon. It makes exactly your point, the wor- This worldview is a tumor, and it's metastasized on multiple fronts. There is no place to avoid this worldview clash. No issue base where it won't be felt. Back here with Hour 2, live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. Steve Dace here with Todd Erzin and all of you. Let us know what you think about what we think via the stevedace.com inbox by emailing us, steve at stevedace.com, D-E-A-C-E. Like us on Facebook, me, we, and Gab. You can follow me at Steve Dace Show on Twitter, get her Instagram, and TikTok. And if you are a podcast aficionado, thank you. If you wouldn't mind, leave us a five-star review if you like the show, of course. Uh, And then also, if you want to make sure you you get a new episode from us every time we do a new episode, hit subscribe, or if you're on iTunes, follow, and that way it will show up in your feed every single time we do one. Got this note from uh, Sarah in our audience. My, My kids and I are up to the 1970s in our homeschool American history class this week. We were reading along in our book, and it only had a short mention of Roe versus Wade. I put the book aside and and took the time to talk about what abortion is and what's going on in our country right now. My tender-hearted eight-year-old son was in tears. I I remember when Noah had a really bad uh, uh, sickness and had to go to the hospital as a little dude, and I took his sisters. He had to be there for a couple days and took his two sisters down to the hospital with me when they were still younger, too. And if you recall, Todd, Mercy Hospital downtown, right across the street, was was the Des Moines Planned Parenthood for many years. It's, yeah. it's been shut down now, but that's where it was, right across the street yes, from was. the hospital. And uh, um, as we're driving away, <clears throat> uh, Zoe, who's really little at the time, sees this building over there and asks me what it is. And Anna's old enough now to know what it is. And she gets, you know, those big eyes that you still see her get as an adult. And she's like, Dad, you got an aunt? Tell her. And so I, I told her the truth, what they do there. And I mean, it, it means Zoe just about broke down. Couldn't believe that we do this to our kids. 
And that's exactly what Sarah is talking about, uh, the experience she had with her tender-hearted eight-year-old son yesterday. Said he was in shock, heartbroken, that we do this every day. And then uh, we cried together and he asked me, Mommy, how do we stop this? And that's when your ads for Preborn came to mind. We looked through their website together. We made a donation. I told him how I heard you say that most moms choose life when they see their baby on an ultrasound. We prayed for the mom who would see her baby because of our donation. And we prayed that she will choose life. I'm a longtime listener. Thank you for letting us know about Preborn. And it was also encouraging to my son that he thought he could, be, he could do something about it. Sarah Soriano in Ames, Iowa, where you just were, with Riley Gaines yesterday, in fact. <clears throat> so thank you, Sarah, and thank you to our friends at Preborn. They can do something about it. They've done something about it literally hundreds of thousands of times. And with the help of people like Sarah in our audience and many of you, you've helped them do something about it tens of thousands of times. Those are people, babies who were, who were allowed to live uh, because of you and your work and your partnership with them. And then moms. Moms who now know the, the blessing that they were given, even in the most tr- difficult and trying of circumstances. And that those circumstances can be at least somewhat redeemed through the promise of this precious new life. And then they also then don't have to deal with the wound on their soul from exterminating it. Like is caused when you make that choice. You guys have helped us with that and helped them. So let's keep it going. Make your donation today. Dial pound 250. Say the keyword baby on your mobile phone. Dial pound 250, keyword baby. Or head over to preborn.com slash Steve. That's preborn.com slash Steve. All right. Are we ready to continue with Romans on Theology Thursday? Yeah, this is going to be good stuff. <clears throat> All right. Let's get to it. And we left off. We actually got through three verses last week. So we left off in verse four. It was a dead sprint last week. All right. So this is basically, yes, it was. So this is basically one opening. So I think they, we have to, as we go back each yeah. week, go back in the context of, of the beginning. Fair? Okay. So let's start verse one again. Paul announcing himself, a servant of Christ Jesus, which is a term meaning to, um, like a, kind of a slave or a bond servant, meaning indebted to, okay, compelled by. That's kind of what that means. Uh, called to be an apostle. Who called him? Christ did. Okay. Set apart for the gospel of God. All right. That's the purpose of his apostolic calling is to preach the gospel, which God promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, meaning that everything that was done in the in the law or in the prophets and said was all pointed to this. There's a moment in the Gospel of John <clears throat> where Jesus, uh, in fact, he does this many times. Christ refers to himself as, as, as an I am. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. Um, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, okay? I am the resurrection and the life. He does this several times in the Gospel of John. Now, why is he using I am? What is that a a hearkening back to, a throwback to? To when Moses, when God speaks to Moses through the burning bush, and Moses says, okay, I mean, what's your name? I mean, who's, who's our God? Who's this Hebrew God that, you know, I don't really know until now that you're telling me I'm going to go to the, to the people and say, it's time for us to, to peace out. We're, we're, we're getting deliverance. You know, who are you? And what's he say? Tell them I am sent you. Okay. And so Christ is, is hearkening to this. He's, he's bestowing. Well, Jesus never claimed to be God except for all the times that he did. All right. And every time he uses the phrase, I am in this context, he is doing so. That's why they wanted to kill him because they understood, they understood what he meant, what he, what, that he, they understood what he was saying and that there was not a middle ground that either he was blaspheming, right, Todd? He's either blaspheming, yes. claiming to be God and he's not, or he's telling the truth. Either way, there are dire consequences for that statement on either side of that calculation. Yes. Either dire consequences for him if he's blaspheming or dire, dire consequences for them if he's telling the truth. But there's not a middle somewhere. It, it, it's an either or scenario. Um, and so this is what Paul is alluding to. All right, that, that God promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, and we went through the over Easter, several of the Messianic Scriptures that Jesus fulfills, right? Concerning the Son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So fully man through the line of David, fully God as the Son of God revealed via resurrection, right? That's 
kind of a, a synopsis of the where we've left off. Fair? Yes. All right. So now we continue on through verse 5. And Paul writes, Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all nations, including you who are called to belong to Christ Jesus. Let's see. Let's start here with what Mr. Spurgeon says about these verses. And just like he did last week when he linked three and four, he put six and seven together. But first about five, uh, he says that what Paul is saying here, uh, he is revealing by whom we have received grace and apostleship, by whom we have received salvation and, uh, and, and authority and calling for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Paul felt that, it w- that he was sent to preach among, uh, to all, among them the Gentiles. And that Paul's diocese, that's the actual term that Spurgeon uses, you'll like that. Paul's diocese included basically every land. He was to preach among all nations. So this is also a statement of his own apostolic calling. And then verses 6 and 7, Spurgeon writes, Among whom you are also the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel is that good news. And the man who has to preach it is full of good wishes. He wishes the best possible things to everybody with whom he comes into contact. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me, I want to repeat this. Because I do think that this is an excellent an excellent an- corollary analog to how I open the show today. It is totally. Okay. Paul, he, what Spurgeon says Paul is also doing here uh, is that when you have received this calling, and Spurgeon would understand this, being called to preach the word himself to the nations. The man who is called to preach wishes the best possible things to everybody with whom he comes into contact. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, It is not going to be too much later in this chapter. We may get to it by the end of the year. (laughs) This very chapter that Paul is going to say some harsh things. How many times have we referred to on this show? Romans Mm one, right? I mean, he is going to talk. He is going to. uh, He he wishes good, good for the people he's preaching to. And to the people he's preaching to, he's going to start a section of this very chapter. Not going to wait long. This very opening chapter, soon he's going to say, the wrath of God is revealed upon mankind in, in these ways among these people. Is that, con- is that affirming? No. Is it nice? No. That doesn't mean, though, it's not good. This goes right to what I was talking about in the opening of the show today. Wanting good things for people will require having to offend them. Make sure you understand the two words I just used. Wanting good things for people will require having to offend them. There's no way to point people to good things all the time without offending them. Are people good? No. No. Is anybody good but God? No. No. So therefore, people are going to make mistakes, right? People are going to want bad things. Right? Yes. And they're going to think bad things are good. Right? Yes. And those things need to be confronted and pointed out. Otherwise, they will, they will be harmed. Maybe even suffer eternal consequences for those kinds of decisions. Ruin marriages and make choices that will last, pass on generations of dysfunction long after they're gone. Right? Yes. Not that, nothing less than eternity is at stake. And so... Wanting good things for people. By the way, Spurgeon, it's funny. If you look at what he was writing about many of the preachers in his day, the, la- the later, the latter 19th century, he's talking about them being liver, you know, yellow bellied. Okay. And, and, and weak and placating people. I, I, I would bet you the preachers he's talking about, we think they're John MacArthur by today's mm. standards. You know what I'm saying? But, but so it, it's not possible now, one of the reasons why we don't know this, and I think we struggle with this, how many of us had a dad and how many of us had a good dad? So we're not preconditioned and disposed and to tough love. 
As our colleague Jason Whitlock says, many most American men are overmothered and underfathered. That's true. And the nurturing spirit doesn't mean men can't nurture. I'm sure there have been moments you've comforted your daughters when they've felt disappointment or failure, and you've just been the shoulder for them to cry on, right? Sure. But your primary instinct is to what? Protect and defend them. Doesn't mean your lovely wife can't, can't protect and defend them and be a mama bear, but her primary instinct is to what? Is to nurture them. This sort of complementarian notion of the sexes and we, these things were just automatics for previous generations of this country. There, it's, revela- it's revelatory now. Okay? Revelatory. We don't know what a woman is. And before that, we long forgot what a man is. <laughs> All right? And so sometimes your dad, the same instinct that will, the same instinct that will, that will cause a good dad to throw himself in front of someone that wants to do harm to you is the same instinct that will cause that dad to look at you and say, what in the Sam Hill were you thinking? What are you, what, wh- why do you think that's a good idea? That might be some of the dumbest crap I've ever heard. You know, sort of like your heavenly father and the scripture verse we read in the first segment of the show that said, you know, uh, because you wouldn't listen to me, I'll just, I'm just going to go ahead and make sure everybody knows uh, that you're being judged. And I'm going to just have you literally, you know, since you kind of crapped the bed when we made you king, I'm going to have you crap yourself out in full view of everybody. So everybody knows, don't follow that example. Same dad. By the way, that's the same dad that when he's on his cross, when, when he's on a cross, puts his arm, stretches him out as far and wide as he can. And says, behold, I make all things new. Same dad. We don't understand sort of this paradoxical nature of masculinity and fatherhood because many of us have not had this modeled to us. But in their culture, it would have been an automatic. Doesn't mean, but they had their own blind spots. They had their own things. And he's going to write, Paul's going to go on and write, and before this moment and after this, he's going to write numerous epistles confronting their blind spots, okay? And he's going to confront several of them as we go through the various chapters of this very work, right? Yes. But that understanding that the same God who judges can also be cried out to as Abba Father. The same totters and whose daughters feel like when they're broken and defeated and the world showed them it's evil again and they can cry on his shoulder, but they also know, do not do evil yourself and disrespect his wife, his bride, because he will punish you for that. Same instincts. This is, this is revelatory to much of our culture today. And so we only understand and can, we, and, and it's not even weakness. It's, a, it's our own programming, right? It's a little bit like when I first started working out wanting to lose weight. I can lift way more than I could the first time. It, it, I, I set one personal best on, Pel, on the Peloton my first year. I've set three of them already this year, meaning I'm, I'm, I'm getting better conditioned to it, right? I'm getting better at it. I've, I've, I'm, I'm a disciple. I've, mm-hmm. I'm disciplined. I'm, I'm getting on that bike for my cardio twice a week. Okay. My cardio, you see what I'm saying? I'm building up now strength, perseverance. I'm conditioned. But when I first started, it was hard. It wasn't that I didn't want to set personal best on the Peloton, Todd. I could not. Mm-hmm. I, I simply couldn't do it. I, I, I wasn't capable of setting personal best all the time. You see what I'm getting at with this? A lot of our men, it's not that they won't be the man you want. They can't. That's why we're trying to get their attention. The programming's not there. No one one imparted that. These things don't just automatically happen. Hey, there's somebody with a penis. They'll know what to do in a situation when things are scary or broken. They won't know. How will they know? That's what we're supposed to pass on. It hasn't been passed on. Have you noticed that? It hasn't been passed I on. Have. It has not been passed on. All right. And so people need to be discipled. Which again goes back to the conversation I had last hour. They're not being discipled. They're watching uh, sword swallowers or being handed the official church, uh, of, you know, monogram sweater vest. Here's what the nice guys wear. It's one or the other. Neither one of them are what we're looking for. And so 
I don't think Paul, I want to make it very clear, I don't think Paul is addressing this in when I'm exegeting out of this. Because he didn't have to. But for our culture, to hear that the person who's about to tell you, you may be under the wrath of God here in about 12 more verses, he's going to tell you this. In about 12 more verses, he's going to tell you, you're probably, you may be under the wrath of God. And you deserve it. Because you did these things. You need to know the guy who told you, who's going to tell you this in about 12 more verses, wants what's best for you. When, when, and when Paul tells the church in Corinth, take the man with his arm around his stepmom, who by who the culture would have looked at as the actual mom at this stage. So the dude with his arm around his mom, throw that guy out. So that Satan, but, but it does, that's not where the sentence ends, is it? So that Satan will have his way with him. What does that mean? So that he will be punished for his sin. So the accuser will punish him for his sin. Because right now you're affirming him in his sin. And so he thinks this is good. And he's setting a terrible example for everybody else. So throw him out. Let the accuser punish him for a while. And then hopefully that will humble him and he'll be repented and say, like the prodigal son, that sucks. And I need to turn away from this and not do this anymore. Make sense? Again, these are things we don't get. Because... We don't have a proper understanding of masculinity. There's no such thing as toxic masculinity. There's just masculinity and toxic men. Masculinity in of itself isn't toxic. Don't ever use that phrase. And so given what we discussed earlier today, I just wanted to park it right there for a second, if you don't mind. And and make a broader point that's applicable to some things we have been discussing on the show as recently as earlier today. All right, so Todd, what's what do you have over on your end of things? Then we'll, we'll look at the notes that Aaron sent along. Well, and I had a similar feeling uh, regarding uh, what you just said. We tend to gloss over and read these things poetically mm-hmm. uh, and then just apply them emotionally because of that and instead of doing it as you just did. I had the exact same... Uh, and I, I didn't know this, obviously. I didn't. Spurgeon's use of the word diocese there. See, that that's really important for what I'm about to say because uh, the church came in and overlaid itself over existing things. Uh, that that is a a term and a a, a a governing boundary authority that existed temporarily that the church is making a claim on. Well, here in this, it uses apostleship for the second time. We've already discussed it right out of the gate because it was in verse one. And then last time fleshed out what that means. We agreed there's power and authority to that. We, yes, as Catholic Protestant, we, where did that go? What does that mean now? We disagree on that. But in here in the here and now, there's real power, spiritual power, as you've ta- you laid out. There's real authority in the other letters that we know precede this. Paul's going in there and saying, this is your leader. This one isn't. So we agree with that. He uses this term again. And it's one thing to use it in any place other than Rome. But this is important. This is his greeting. We're going to sum up his greeting today. He's coming in with this greeting. This greeting basically amounts to Captain Phillips. That guy comes on the ship. I'm the captain now. Because when he says the grace of apostleship, what is it to do? To bring about obedience. Called to be holy. Rome was used to and comfortable with a certain like a lot of crazy mystery cults doing your own thing making claims to the eternal to real truth but at the end of the day there's an understanding yeah you do you but you know the time and the place to bend the knee Mm -hmm. there's no pretensions about this and again paul isn't just some guy who doesn't understand the terra firma in rome he's a roman And a Roman scout, he Mm -hmm. understands what he's doing here. He's coming in, and this is really important for the times we've been living in the last month, because this isn't all that slap-ass Christ the King stuff. This is Christ the King stuff. This is what it really means. This is what he means. Yeah. And that what Spurgeon says, I, I, I'm riffing off what Spurgeon says when he's using the term diocese. Again, this is a pre-existing notion that existed in Rome territorial governments he's coming in saying all of that paul is saying it in a pretty nice way here it's just a greeting but he's saying that i'm the captain now one more to a point christ is the captain now christ is king and it is nothing short of that there's no ambiguity 
about what he's trying to accomplish here. That's what the apostleship he's bringing into the table. And he's not equivocating. He says, I'm not just another mystery cult. I'd like a seat at the table. No, no, no. Christ is king, period. And then he concludes it by saying to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace and peace to you. That's what I was just talking about from God, the father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, this idea that you could express sincere well wishes to people while in the midst of, de- of, of, of making sure everybody understands the order of things as you were just laying out. Yeah. And then later on, you're going to understand people need to know what the lay of the land currently is that we're up against. This is just kind of different to how we are used to being coddled and communicated to today. And this is, and this is a prime example of why I primarily blame the church for almost everything happening. Because it is not the human condition to not want to be coddled. The human condition is the opposite. The human condition is uh, this woman you gave me. That's the human condition. So somebody else is, uh, well, didn't God put you in charge? Put Adam in charge, right? Then he's like this woman. So who was in charge the whole time? He was. That, that's The human condition is to act as if, uh, is, is, is to not want to put these kinds of things together. And then our culture has incentivized these things in ways that I don't know that any culture previously in human history in terms of creating soft-headed people has ever done. So if, 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 if I know because you haven't been taught scriptures like Second Chronicles chapter 21 that I did last hour. You know, one of our evergreens we've recorded for this year is top 10 scripture verses your soft-headed megachurch pastor likely will never preach. Many of these are sections of the Bible that, you know, they're, they're like the parts of the, uh, in the ministry of magic, that you're, the, the, the forbidden books, or, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the, the temple that Dr. Strange is at. You're not allowed to go in there and read those, okay? We've done that. We've done like a reverse Gnosticism. We, we've gone from... Here's hidden knowledge that God should have included in the scriptures to taking things out of them. Because you can't handle it. We've gone from here's the extra stuff God forgot to tell you because he doesn't care for you to here's the stuff because God doesn't care for you. We don't want to tell you because you might get disappointed in God. Really? That's really what we've done. Also, what you articulated there is why I always say when we have when we have the questions about the broader catholic evangelical or catholic protestant dis- disagreements i'm always i always say these are not theological disagreements they're ecclesiastical ones because if because if i were to if i were to ask an average catholic why do you believe in something fill in the blank um tradition that a protestant would say is either extra biblical or unbiblical because it's not specified in there an average catholic that is that is knowledgeable is good is going to rely on church authority to say this is a proper rightly dividing and interpreting of of the at least the spirit of the of the scriptures right yeah and then if you come to me on, on the or you come to a protestant on the other end and say well why don't you guys do these customs that we do and the protestant's going to say what well, we're, that's not in the Bible. That's why we don't do those things, right? Yes. So these are, these are really questions of authority. And, and everything really is a question of authority. Another way of saying this is everything is a question of dominion, which just so happens to be a, the word theme of our year. Everything is. Go back to last hour. Either by the grace of God or... Just the randomness of Donald Trump's personnel personnel decisions or a little bit of both. We ended up with evangelicals in two of the most powerful positions to influence our government. Vice President and Speaker of the House. And they both failed the country miserably. Mike Pence signed off on the shutting down of the church. Stop that. Stop. Stop. Let's not look at anything else and just stop with that. Mike Pence evangelical vice president helmed a commission that shut the church down. Do we need to look at anything else in Mike Pence's career? We can just stop there. Stop there. He signed off on shutting down the churches. Look Look at what Mike Johnson's doing. He won't shut things down like the border or anything. For Ukraine. They failed. The question of dominion was asked. They chose the spirit of the age. Both times. Choose ye this day whom you will serve. Why do you call me Lord if you do not do what I say? 
my sheep hear my voice. You know a tree by its fruit. In other words, what ultimately is your authority? trying to think of what Aaron has. And if we aren't clear about what that authority is while you're thinking through that, again, w- to the point here, why would we obey? Mm-hmm. We don't know. Like, really, your average person who is genuinely looking yeah, for something Yeah, because we're not predisposed to, show, to obey God. They're looking God. like, who yeah. am I supposed to believe right now? Yep. Let's throw this in from Aaron to close it out. This is hopefully something most modern believers agree with, what Paul is saying, and and, uh, that Christ's sonship was being declared by the disciples, the apostles, or the members of the early church wasn't being declared by those things. His sonship is declared by the resurrection via the Holy Spirit. However, to the church in Rome, doctrinally sound as they were, this was probably a reminder of the constant gut check they were called to as they lived amongst a pagan culture. Another question of authority. Is the culture the authority? Is Roman is Roman influence the authority, or is Christ and the apostles that he appointed the authority? Everything's a question of dominion. Literally everything is. Under whose authority do I think I am under, my own or somebody else's or God's, in every decision I make? And while you may have no idea when you truly come into power and authority, for example, there's 300 plus years until Constantine comes along, you never reject your own premise simply because times are hard. Mm-hmm. You keep that premise mm-hmm. healthy, alive, and well, mm-hmm. and the fruits come when the fruits come. But again, every most uh, just speaking for my own tribe, because it's the one I have the most experience with, most evangelicals have been taught that God had no power to save them until they figured out that they needed Jesus. So they are, they are sovereign over their own salvation, um, uh, that, that their sanctification process is an opt in or opt out. Okay. Uh, they're rarely challenged at church at all. They're rarely told they have to suffer for what they believe at all. They're really given, rarely given examples of that whatsoever. And so again, this is, this is anathema. This, 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 this programming isn't wired. And I didn't realize that when I started doing this talk. I mean, I, I thought I was just going to rally the silent majority and they just lacked direction. I didn't realize there isn't a silent majority. And that's why we're now doing stuff like this on the show, as opposed to the political activism full time I planned on doing when I got into this. Got to go back. One plants, another waters, then God gives the increase. More in a moment. This can be one of the funkiest times of the year weather-wise. I have had both the central air and now the heat on in the last four days. All right. It's just, you know, part of the spring in the Midwest, you know, you can get a summer preview one day and, you know, you're wearing uh, the same pullover uh, show branded uh, sweater as a, uh, as your, uh, you know, your show editor on the exact same day because you're both chilly. So what's that mean when it comes to sleeping? Nothing. Absolutely nothing if you got our friends over at Miracle Made, man. You don't have to worry about it. I'm telling you, these things are incredible. They held up last summer. We had one of the hottest summers in recent memory. And they held up first. And, and, and this is the first summer in our home ever. I didn't have to turn the ceiling fan on to augment the AC, not a single night. And then we had the coldest, one of the coldest Januaries, I think, in the history of the nine realms of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Same thing. They held up then too. Uh, it's inspired by NASA. Miracle Made has used or uses silver infused fabrics that make temperature regulating bedding, so you sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. They're phenomenal. They're comfy. That's important too. Um, highly recommend them. And if you want to give them a shot, um, tr- go to trymiracle.com slash dace. That's trymiracle.com slash dace. Try those Miracle Made sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use my name, Dace, last name Dace is a promo code, uh, at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20% as well. All right? You can't beat it. All right? Trymiracle.com slash dace is where you want to go. Trymiracle.com 
Bet.com slash Dace and make sure to use the promo code Dace. It is time for three non-political questions. We all have questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? Who am I? A search and a question of identity. Why am I here? A question of meaning and purpose. Where am I going? Question of destiny. Some better than others. What sort of morality or proto-morality would you expect to find in a chimpanzee troop? Injecting some levity into the demise of Western civilization. It's three questions on the Steve Day Show. And look who we have here. The last time we laid eyes upon my oldest daughter, she had yet to give birth to a live human being. (laughs) And now she can check that off her bucket list. Anastasia, welcome back, sweetie. How are you? Good. I liked the matching outfits. I thought it was cute. You thought that was nice? Yeah, I thought it was like a cute little moment for you guys. Did you guys call each other the night before and lay out your outfits together? We didn't. It was completely coincidental. Yeah. It was. And then someone reminded me that I violated the dude code by even noticing what Todd is wearing. And for that, I admitted and I am ashamed. That is correct. (laughs) Yes. So how have you been? What have you been up to? (laughs) Right. Just have a little human child attached to my hip. 24-7. 24-7. So, so what's it, what, how, you, what do you want to, the audience has questions. Of course, you have your own privacy. You may reveal whatever you want to reveal, but people are going to want to know how did it go and how is your baby girl? Good. I, overall, the process was, it was hard because I ended up having to be induced on a Wednesday night. And then um, my daughter, Autumn, was not born until Friday, like around lunch. So that was difficult because it was all night Wednesday night, all day Thursday, all night Thursday night, all morning Friday. Hmm. And then she came within like 40 minutes. She was like, all right, let's cut the crap. She was like, let's do this thing. And then she came in. It was, I mean, it was nice. She was so, when she was first born, I'll never forget. Because usually babies, they like cry and cry and cry and cry. And she like cries for a couple minutes to let us know that she's all right. And she just, she just stops and she just like stares at us both. Like the biggest eyes you've ever seen. Just like. Like you. (laughs) Just kind of looking at us like, wow, did we just really do this? This is crazy, right? (laughs) She's like, this is weird, right? But so that was great. And she's honestly, I mean, she has her little moments, you know, but she is honestly great. She sleeps like five to six hours at night at a time, which is great. So I don't like today people at TFL were like, wow, you look, you know, not like like you're dragging or anything. I'm like, honestly, you know. It's pretty good. We've come to a rhythm now. She's six weeks old tomorrow already, which is crazy. So we've kind of gotten into our own, our own rhythm. And so. you're ready. You're ready for another one. No. <laughs> <laughs> the other day, my husband Stephen was like, "We should have as many kids as God allows." I was like, "I'm gonna have to talk with God one on one about that. <laughs> I need a little time." We. Uh, after that. You want to you want to talk about little moments? As as I was listening to you describe becoming a mom. Just in my mind's eye, it was flashing back to when you were little and used to come and do appearances on the show every year for your birthday. And uh, one year, we had some very special guests at the uh, at WHO radio, my first <laughs> news talk radio job. And they just had their 100th anniversary, I saw, on the internet. I did not even know. They, and uh, we had some very special guests one day around your birthday that were there they 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 were they would go on to become some of the biggest stars of this era but they they weren't really that known yet they were kind of on their way up do you remember this uh, i won't let anybody else forget it th- yes. about this yes yep. and i had you come in through the basement because that was my entrance all right because there was a lounge down there where the rock station in our in our station conglomerate would hold like private conf- con- concerts and stuff for vips and people and contest winners and i got you in there and as uh as a birthday present do you remember the act that was performing it was the jonas brothers it was the jonas brothers yeah and they were just coming out they i think maybe had like their first single Purity at the time. rings still intact yeah the parents were still traveling with them <laughs> yeah exactly yeah and um I mean, you got to I got to hang with them. You got to get a. We have a, a picture with you them as a little with you uh, with them as a little girl. I don't know why I just thought about that. Listening you talk about your own daughter. I think, think about anybody that. who's ever met me has seen that picture because I find every and any excuse You're kind of to proud show of it that still. picture <laughs> and tell that story. Yeah. <sighs> so, so Todd, this is what you've got to look forward to, brother. 
Can't wait. Can't yeah. wait. Got some time yet, but I can't wait. I know they're your little girls, but uh, one day, not too far off, they're going to be someone else's mama. You know? So that takes the things to an entire life. life. It, it does. It takes things to a whole new level. All right. Let's get to the matter at hand. You have some questions for us? I do. All right. Let's fire away. All right. My first question for you guys is, what is your favorite non-Christian movie that has great Christian themes within it? That's a that's an excellent question. Um, I I mean I could give a lot of answers to this, but y- I'm going to go with Wonder Woman, the first one, because the worldview that I mean first of all I love the movie, but the worldview that is communicated there. I mean, I think of the scene, for example, where Wonder Woman is trying to cross no man's land, which is the land of, uh, with the trenches and the mines from World War I. And like, it wasn't safe to walk across it because it was so littered with explosives and munitions and you were constantly under uh, someone else's uh, target. And, uh, and she tries, and she's a superhero. And yet, despite the fact she's a superhero, she cannot, even as a superhero, she can't cross no man's land on her own. Okay. And, and requires the complementary, complementary notions of the sexes to do it. Okay. I mean, this is the, so the men must now take the, she can only get so far on her own and now the men must come and take the lead. All right. To get, to get to the finish. Um, Aries, I, I, I just give him little nudges. I mean, he's basically Satan in the film. Um, I, I, I would say Wonder Woman the Dark Knight does a great job if Heath Ledger's basically playing Satan. But the, the, the other redemptive part of the story, it's called The Dark Knight after all, okay, is kind of missing from that, even though that's one of the greatest films I think ever made. Mm-hmm. But, it, but, both, but both the, but the but demonstrating the redemptive star, part, part of our narrative, the, Wonder Woman, the first Wonder Woman movie does an incredible job with that while being a heck of a film at the same time. I mean, that, that summer, how many conversations, Todd, did we have about that movie? Did, yeah. do they, were they aware of mm-hmm. what they were saying? And we could do an entire exegesis on that film, frankly. So I'm, uh, that's the first one that came to my mind, so I'm going to go with that one. Uh, well, under the category of they definitely weren't aware of what they were saying, um, but sometimes they can't help but tell these stories because they're just the greatest stories ever told. Uh, Shawshank Redemption, mm-hmm. which is based off a book by Stephen King. Yep. But I mean, it, it's just, and Andy Dufresne himself talks about, you know, he didn't, he went to jail for a crime he didn't commit, but in the middle of that, he basically gives a, but I was a sinner. Uh, nonetheless, mm-hmm. I turned my wife away, uh, and that caused all the tension uh, that led to this. And then he is long suffering. And when he, at the end, when he's talking about um, uh, getting out, in, or, or Red goes to follow him, uh, Morgan Freeman and says, I, I find I'm so excited. I can't hold a thought in my head or sit still. I think it's the kind of freedom only a free man can feel, you know. When Steve tells you about how the Holy Spirit moved him out of a chair in Kansas City and brought him to an altar, that's that's what he's talking about. Amen. Amen. Those are pretty good answers, do you think, to start question one? I think. I tried to kind of knock it out of the park. Yeah, you did. When it. I thought of a, this. No, that was a good question. Late last night. <laughs> <laughs> question two brought to you by our friends at Constitution Wealth. They are the Patriots' choice in wealth management. If you are somebody who is trying to avoid doing business with companies on the commerce level uh, because they explicitly hate your values whenever you can, why not do the same thing on an investment level as well? Our friends at Constitution Wealth can help you with that. They can help to diversify your portfolio by divorcing you from ESG, DEI, and other woke spirit of the age schemes uh, and that will also put your profits to profitable use uh, there if you get uh, the connotation of the word so work with an advisor who shares your conservative patriotic values why work with anyone else if you don't have to Uh, if you are in possession of 250k or more in stock and bond investments they're looking for you at constitutionwealth.com slash steve again constitutionwealth.com slash steve all right question two all right, so in honor of the recent nefarious anniversary, I thought I'd do a nefarious-themed question for you. What is the biggest message that you think people missed or overlooked in the movie? Well, apparently, I overlooked the power of a cheeseburger because the 
I mean, when I first read the script and got to that scene, I laughed out loud in a room by myself because I just thought it was a funny way to truly embody the character I created. Just, people like bawling in the and, and then I th- when the movie comes out and I'm like, I, you know, people are like sending me notes, crying. Okay. <laughs> My kids thought were just broke down that they denied the guy the cheeseburger. I was like, so I apparently missed the power of that uh, symbolism. I mean, I, I, when I, when we were making the film, I kind of took that as a, as a, as a, almost malevolently funny way for nefarious to demonstrate his level of spite for humanity. Mm -hmm. Instead, people who have actual souls and hearts, unlike me, they were broken by it. (laughs) I'll never forget in the theater, one of the first times we watched it, you like laughed at that and it was complete silence everywhere else. It was you just one laugh. Yeah. And everybody else was like... (laughs) You just hear like sniffles and stuff yes. and it's crazy. And then you just look horrible like yes. laughing by yourself. I think um, this question's hard for me to answer because I know everything that we were trying to convey. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, so I know the, I have got access to the Rosetta Stone on this one, you know? So I, I think I'll just, I'll, I'll make it personal and reverse the premise of your question, if you don't mind, and say what I just said. I was not aware of the power of the symbolism of that cheeseburger. So the people made me aware of that. Todd, what about you? Well, I saw this play out in an actual on-air question that somebody asked Sean on something I saw. But I, I people don't seem to understand um, when finally James decides to play the game and says... Okay, inhabit me. Mm-hmm. And then just moves on. And th- there appeared to be some level of confusion of what just happened there when it is actually the mo- like the whole movie turns on opening the door that wide uh, to the demon. Mm-hmm. And, That's a good one. And for it to be confusing is uh, uh, frustrating because let that to the extent that we do that every day all the time by, per what we talked about in Romans, not being obedient. It's kind of that's good. The whole ball game. Yep, that's really good. All right, question three brought to you by our friends over at Fast Growing Trees. Did you know they have the largest online nursery in the United States with more than 10,000 different kinds of plants and over 2 million happy customers? If you want to be one of them, you're thinking, but I don't have a big yard. What if I told you you didn't even have to have a yard? You can grow even lemon, avocado, olive, or fig trees even inside your home. Uh, on top of a wide variety of house plants as well. They can make it work for any space or any climate. They'll customize it for you. They've got, again, that fantastic catalog. Uh, you can have access to their experts uh, as well, as long as you need to. Uh, free plant consultation forever. So they've got the best deals online and they'll help you take advantage of those deals as well. Uh, get an additional 15% off on top of all their sales right now. They've got like half on, half off uh, selected plants and other deals. What if you got an additional 15% off by using the code DACE at checkout when you go to fastgrowingtrees.com. That's fastgrowingtrees.com. Use the code DACE at checkout to get an additional 15% off. Even if it's one of the things on special, you can still get an additional 15% off at fastgrowingtrees.com using the code DACE at checkout. All right, final question, sweetheart. And then final question is, other than Jesus, obviously, who is the most inspiring person in the Bible to you and why? Nehemiah. I mean, I would have had different answers at different stages of my life. You know, I would have, uh, I identify with Peter actually quite a bit. Uh, A guy uh, prone uh, to running his mouth. Uh, without thinking, uh, prone to uh, aggressive action. Often, uh, Peter, like me, believes that you solve your problems with aggression. Okay, so (laughs) at other periods of my life, I would have identified with him uh, or others. But for where I'm at at, at right now in, in life and where I think the culture is, it's Nehemiah. And I think we need a lot more. Uh, uh, we need to make, we need to make Nehemiah great again. Okay, uh, there needs to be a spirit of Nehemiah resurgent uh, within a, within the American church. Absolutely doesn't mean doesn't mean we have to commit physical assault. Okay. <laughs> but we need to be willing to. <laughs> right. Okay. So uh, I'm going to say Nehemiah. You said inspiring. Yeah. Well, let's go full Catholic and go Mary. I mean, the, who am I 
the the question she asks her, uh, horse herself, but humbling herself to the calling, uh, nonetheless, and having that juxtaposed uh, to somebody uh, her own um, co- cousin in law, uh, Zachariah, husband of Elizabeth, whose voice was taken away because he he should have known uh, what was being uh, talked about uh, and doubted or questioned. Um, you know, she's she's an integral uh, part uh, um, of the greatest story ever told um, because she embodies so much of what was foreshadowed in the Old Testament. Good question, sweetie. And Thank it was you. good to have you back. We're out of time, though. Thank you. All right. You're going to be back here next week? Yeah. Autumn, autumn willing. All right. Autumn willing. That's, <laughs> that's life as a mama. All right. We're going to stick around and do overtime for the rest of you. We'll see you tomorrow. Until then, Romans 8, 28.